listening to a message on family from Shane Caldwell, who is on staff with the Indian Creek Christian Church down in Indianapolis uh, that he had preached last fall. And it was part of a series that they called All In. And the series focused on subjects that as Christians, we should desire to be all in on. And as I listened to that, I thought, you know, this is the makings of a great idea to preach on at the beginning of the new year, because it challenges us and encourages us to not only review our values, but it also encourages and motivates us to commit to things that really matter and are important. And so I want to thank the good folks at the Creek for inspiring the idea of this message series that I'm preaching on at the start of 2022. I'm calling it Making Commitments, The Choice is Yours. We talk about making New Year's resolutions, don't we? But sometimes we don't take those very seriously. But what if we thought about them a little differently? What if we thought about them as commitments we're making to things that are really important, to things that we value, because these are things that God values. Well, at the beginning of a new year, we all have choices to make, don't we? And the question is, what choices are you making? And really the question we want to look at over the next five weeks is, are you committing your life to what matters most? Today we're looking at commitment to family. Am I committed to my family? What does being committed to family even look like? You know, I've come to realize that our commitment to family doesn't stop once all the kids have grown up and, and left home to live their own lives. Certainly I recognize the importance of being committed to my family while our children were growing up, but I'm not sure I've always thought that family commitment was as important now that they're out of the house and they're on their own. But it is. Whether it's watching grandkids or having supper together or offering wise counsel or helping our adult children to trim trees and plant flowers, family commitment is still necessary. This past week, I went down to Toledo to help my oldest daughter paint rooms that had been needing to be painted for a long time, but, but because of her, the busyness in her life, and it was a difficult task for her to do by herself, and she just wasn't getting to it. So I was able to go down there and, and help her get that done, and I'm discovering that how I show family commitment changes over time and in different seasons of life, but it is still necessary, and it's still even desired. Can you relate to any of these quotes? Families are like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts. And <laughs> <laughs> what about this one? My family is temperamental, half temper and half mental. <laughs> or can you relate to this one? Our family motto is, well that escalated quickly. <laughs> this quote about family made me laugh. Some call it chaos, we call it family. <laughs> Have you ever heard this one? The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and usually when it's said, it's not a compliment. I've often said to my wife, you think I'm messed up? You should see the family from which I came. <laughs> it still doesn't get me out of trouble, though. But seriously, I was very blessed to be able to know both sets of grandparents. On each side of my family, I knew all of my grandparents, my great-grandparents. I'm blessed with aunts and uncles who still reach out and interact with me. I have cousins and brothers and sisters that I grew up with and played with, even stepbrothers and stepsisters through the years. I've been blessed uh, to experience living on a farm as well as living in town. There were plenty of good times growing up, but things were far from perfect. And to be honest, my growing years had plenty, plenty of pain in them. Through the good and the bad, one thing has been made clear to me, though, very clear. Our families are important. Now, some of you have very few good memories of your family, and some in this room and listening through our live stream have been damaged by the words and or actions of family members. And I can tell you, I know how hard it can be to work through some of the damage that has been done to you, but I also want you to know 
that God can take the ugly things and bring something good out of it. I don't believe he causes the damage, but he can change it so that it results into something that's good. And I think that's what Paul means when in Romans 8.28 he says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Ugliness of actions and words, they don't have to define you. They don't have to keep you down. They can refine you and they can make you more insightful and they can make you stronger and they can make you better. And sometimes we can work through that stuff ourselves, sometimes not. And so if you need help sorting through it all, find a Christian therapist or another trusted Christian or a friend or a minister who can help you to get pointed in the right direction. I have no doubt that God wants you, that he wants us to find healing and health. And I, I get it that the words spoken in Jeremiah 29, 11 were spoken to the Israelites as a nation. But I also believe there's an aspect of truth to these words that applies to us individually as well. That's where the prophet speaking for God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope. And a future. And certainly God wants our families to succeed and prosper. And he can rescue families that are hurting because he created healthy families to be the building blocks of society. Do you realize that in order for our communities to be stable, the families that comprise our communities must be stable as well. And as we raise godly families, we also expand the family of God. But while family relationships are important, we all know strong families don't just happen on their own, out of the blue. Sustaining a marriage, raising children are challenging things to do. And if we want to have happy homes, we have to work hard to create them. So how do we do that? Well, one of the best ways to strengthen your family is by observing the common traits and the qualities that are shared by successful families. So this morning, let's look at some of the most vital characteristics of healthy families from a biblical perspective. What does the Bible have to say about this? When it comes to your family, here are six ways for you to renew your commitment to family in this new year. First, don't give up on each other. Members of strong families have difficulties, and they have disagreements, and they have stuff that comes up just like everyone else does. They get laid off from work and they can't find a job. Or maybe they struggle to make ends meet. Or maybe kids and parents don't see eye to eye. What sets them apart, though, is that they don't give up on each other when circumstances get strained and ugly, or when one or more family members disappoint and let them down. They have a steady and unwavering dedication to each other. They have a commitment to stay together through good times and bad. No family member ever feels like they don't belong. In Luke 15, we read of the love of the father for his prodigal son, whom he loves no matter what. This is the love of parents who stay beside their son or daughter when their children are doing things that are harmful for themselves, or maybe that you disagree with. The parents see the problem with the kids' choices, but they still work hard to maintain that relationship. The parents may not approve of the choices a child makes, but they're totally committed to loving their child. And I believe God calls us to love one another, and he links that to our love for him. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, we read, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So as family, we don't give up on one another. There's a second way to show your commitment to family this year. Make time to be together. Family commitment shows up as making time to be together. It's a priority. For immediate family, long, week, uh, long work weeks and school activities and sports and band and household chores and all the things that keep us busy, it can make family time hard to find. For extended family, busy holiday seasons and long drives or flights and the speed of life make time with family hard to come by, doesn't it, sometimes? Still, healthy families always find ways to be together, no matter how busy they think they are, 
even if some of that time is communicating with each other through phone calls or from screen to screen. When we spend quality time together as a family, we express by our actions that we value each other, that we care about each other. And this helps to build and strengthen those family bonds. I remember back in the 90s when my kids were little, and we enjoyed watching TGIF Friday nights. Anybody else do that? TGIF on Friday nights. And we'd pull out the couch bed, and we'd eat popcorn and other snacks, and we'd play games as we watched TV sitcoms like Full House and Family Matters and Growing Pains and all those other programs. These days, making time to be together might mean going out to Arizona or California periodically to reestablish ties with parents. Or it means carving out time during holidays to get together with our adult children who now live in three different states. It takes effort to make that happen. Making time to be together sometimes means heading over to Owasso to meet up with aunts and uncles whom I haven't seen in a while. Well, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7 reminds parents that we have a responsibility to spend time together so that we can pass along our faith to our children and to others who might be part of our family. There we read, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And so God wants us to talk about it. He wants us to talk about his word. And the implication is that this takes place when we are simply just together. Sometimes we parents and grandparents need to get rid of distractions temporarily that keep us apart. I think of distractions like TV or the earbuds or video games or smartphones. Sometimes we just got to put those away so we can interact with one another. And the key to building relationships is to spend time together in all types of situations, including everyday normal activities. Here's a third way to commit to your family in 2022. Show appreciation for each other. Malachi 4.6 points out that when people, both young and old, are living in relationship with God, children and parents live in reconciliation and peace with each other. Malachi 4.6 says... He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I'll come and strike the land with total destruction. I've noticed the truth of that when families are breaking apart in untold numbers. When we live in peace as families, we show appreciation for each other. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, it also says we're to show appreciation for each other when we choose to get along and honor one another. That's where we read Paul's words, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In other words, kids, obey your parents until you're out of the house and then continue to honor them for the rest of your life because of the role they play in your life and because of their love for you. Parents don't create resentment in your children. Parents are to train their children to distinguish right from wrong in everyday life. But this training should take place within the context of loving and caring and a forgiving relationship. We know appreciation for one another when instead of always being critical, we can show that we care about one another and show people how special they are. So let's not be quite so critical. Let's show more appreciation. You want to renew your commitment to family this year? Here's a fourth way to do that. Family are to look out for one another. You know, a healthy family treats each member as they would like to be treated. And in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus himself taught... In everything, do to others what you would have them do for you, because this sums up the law and the prophets. What do we call this? It's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others. We talked about this in Sunday school today. And when we treat our family members in a selfless way, 
This creates an emotional and spiritual atmosphere in which each member of the family feels loved and is inspired to work for the good of the family. Sometimes, however, looking out for one another means helping each other with our physical needs, right? As 1 Timothy 5.8 points out, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I don't think the Bible is telling us to take care of a family member's every want, but it is encouraging us to care for our family's needs as we're able to do so. Sometimes this means paying some bills for someone or getting them to a doctor's appointment when there's that need. Sometimes it's simpler, such as giving up something you'd like to do so that you can do something for your spouse that they'd like to do. Or maybe it's a dad ignoring what he'd like to do on his day off in order to take his kids to do something that brings them joy. Again, showing commitment to family means looking out for one another. A fifth idea for renewing commitment to your family is to resolve conflict quickly and in a God-honoring way. Have you ever noticed that often we offend and hurt those that we're closest to? We do, don't we? Well, Romans 12, 18 encourages us to live in peace with one another, not to live in constant conflict. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Misunderstanding happens. But if family members don't make sincere peace with each other, it can lead to bitterness. It can lead to grudges on both sides. When offenses occur in healthy families, bad feelings are not left undiscussed. They're not left undealt with. Now maybe you need to step away from a situation momentarily to regain your composure, to you know, kind of let your anger subside so you don't just verbally vomit on someone. But conflicts are resolved quickly rather than allowed to just fester slowly like water boiling on the stove. I'm touched by the story that Janet Breitenstein shares in her article, Ten Ideas, Living the Gospel in Your Home. She tells of the time when she called her four-year-old from work after having yelled at him earlier that morning at home. She apologized before leaving to go to work, but then she admitted later that she was reflecting on that, but she hadn't really apologized truly out of a, a repentant heart. And she had been so mad at her son that all she could do was focus on his error. She just could not let that go. And so she picked up her cell phone and she called him, attempting to be more like Jesus with her attitude and words. And in her article, she says, I will always remember his response. After I'd apologized for being so harsh... <laughs> He said, Mommy, I forgive you, and I want to let you know that even when you do bad things, I still love you. <laughs> and he continued, and I want you to know that even when you do bad things, God still loves you too. <laughs> well, after that, she felt really bad for yelling at him. <laughs> but then she thought about what was happening here as her four-year-old son repeated the gospel back to her in this way, in his own little way. She thought, you know... Not only does he get it, but he's applying it to life. Resolving conflict in a God-honoring way means that things get talked out without family members attacking each other personally. They address the issues. Every family member must show grace, but parents and grandparents must set the tone in their home for apologies and taking responsibility and being role models of what healthy communication and resolving conflict looks like. Here's one last way to renew commitment to your family at the start of a new year. Always focus on Jesus first. Psalm 37 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. When individual family members learn to love God, and when they learn to respect his principles and follow biblical instructions, guess what? They're going to be closer to one another. They have a reason to work at their relationships, and, and they're more likely to stay together. They're able to put trials and difficulties into perspective and to maintain the right focus. God's Word provides guidelines for living, which helps families create a positive home life. Of course, to be a spiritually committed family, parents must set the pace and reflect their commitment to God in their own personal lives. 
If your younger kids see you studying your Bible, and if they see you serving others and see you living out God's truths, and if you talk about God's way of life as you go through your day-to-day -day activities together, they're going to know that God is your top priority. And if you're looking for help to read through your Bible, grab one of those Our Daily Bread devotionals off the entryway table. They're free. Gives you a daily devotional thought. If you want to read through the Bible in this next year, every day they give you passages that you can read. So that by the time you get to December 31st, then you will have read through the whole Bible, if you do it. <laughs> but, you know, I think one thing that families need to do more is talk about heaven. I wish we had talked about heaven more in my family. Speak often of heaven and what it will be like with Jesus emphasizing that this world is not our ultimate home, because what we see now is not the whole story. Another powerful story that Janelle Breitenstein shares in her article is about the time when a 21-year-old friend of theirs was on life support after a horrible car accident. Her friend passed away, and when she received word about it, she turned her back to her four-year-old son, and she just wept. And after she composed herself, she turned back to her son, and she said, I want you to know that I just found out our friend went to be with Jesus today. And her son, with excitement in his voice, said, I heard. He goes, I heard. And I'm thinking, what can possibly cause someone to respond to tragedy in that kind of way? Heaven. Janelle goes on to say, all of our family's conversations about heaven bore fruit in that moment. It actually made me laugh with joy as I saw my son connect the dots between our current reality and heaven's true reality. Our 21-year-old friend's death, she says, though utterly tearing our hearts, was still a coronation day for him, the pinnacle of his life thus far. And while I wept, my four-year-old was saying, that guy is one lucky duck. <laughs> this is the good news, that God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die for our sins, and was resurrected back to life, so that we could be reconciled to God, and enjoy him forever. So that we can live in peace with those around us, and experience the increasing fulfillment of our relationships. And in Philippians 3, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul proclaims the centrality of the gospel to life when he says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And so if the gospel is central to the point that all else is garbage, it also must be central to my marriage, and to my family. It requires that we choose to be committed to both our family and our faith. The world needs to see families from the church love each other in ways that are dynamic and compelling and better than the world has to offer. May your family and mine find ourselves centered in this gospel and looking forward to the triumphant return of Jesus to this earth when he comes to take us home one day. And I hope that you'll join me in making family a testimony that proclaims God's love to the lost world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that you have created family, that you have brought us together in, in this way to find nourishment and to build character. Lord, maybe for some of us, family isn't necessarily biological. Maybe family is being adopted. Maybe family is becoming part of someone else's family who loves you. And in them we find a role model. But God, we know that you are greater than anything else in this world. We pray that you become greater in our families this year. May we show commitment to family because we know that that is something that you value.
May we leave here with your favor and your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray.